how how concerned are you that we're headed toward um, something that is going to result in conflict with the U.S. Are we in, in danger of, of this uh, escalating directly with the United States? Sure, we're in danger of it. Listen, it's not too late, but that's why I think reasonable voices uh, like my own are going to continue to call on the administration and say, you got to get tougher guys. And the negotiators, they're going to have to somehow convince Hamas that President Biden means business. All right. Happy Halloween. It is Tuesday. This is the Sean Spicer show. Uh, before we get to the serious stuff, I want, I don't know if you're dressing up or not, but I, I wanted to have some fun. Now I've done a lot of different things in the past. Uh, I've had some fun, some good costumes. I thought I actually had a fun costume this year. I want to take a listen. Guess who I dressed up as? Take a look at the video. Happy Halloween for me, Pennsylvania's junior Senator, John Fetterman. Okay. So there you go. Here's the question. I'm going to put a side by side. Take a look on the screen. You'll see uh, Senator Fetterman and me. So here's the question. You know, if you ever peruse Us Us Weekly, Us Weekly, is that the magazine? In the back, they say, or in the front, they say, who wore it best? So tell me, engage on the comments. Tell me who wore, <laughs> who wore the hoodie and the gym shorts the best. Uh, I, you know, I would hope that I'd get your vote, but I mean, then again, I'm not a U.S. Senator that wears that to work. So share with me your thoughts. Tell me what you think, uh, rate my outfit, uh, from one to 10. So who wore it best? How do you think I did put it in the comments and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes forward. So I don't know. Uh, also let me know who you're dressing up as. I want to, I want to get a little feedback here. Um, okay. Before we get to this conversation with Morgan, I'm going to tell you, so I want to get to the conversation. I want to get her perspective first, and then I'll share with you my thoughts after that. And I also want to talk to you about what Speaker Mike Johnson's doing, because kudos to him. This guy came out of the gate swinging, and he is showing what we've been talking about. You know, before I said, I want someone to fight. I want someone to show. And the narrative is always like, well, that's not going to pass. Why is it that the, they get to determine what's going to pass and not? The House is a co-equal branch of the legislature. It doesn't just sit there and say, oh, well, the Senate doesn't want to do this. Why isn't it? Oh, the Senate won't, do, you know, like make the Senate eat what the House is doing. It's so backwards. But that's the thing is because the Dems control the Senate. Well, we've got to do this. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um but I do want to get to Morgan because there's a lot to break down. Um, what's happening with Hamas? Um, also, I mean, you think about it. She was the State Department spokesman. How would they have handled these hostages? What is going on with Iran? How is it escalating? Um, and what should we be prepared for? Because I'll tell you, you hear a lot of these folks talk. They're concerned about Iran escalating this. And if Iran escalates... What does the U.S. do? And are we headed for um, a, a major conflict that the U.S. is going to be involved in? I know that sounds uh, maybe concerning, and it should be, because this is where we're headed. These guys smell weakness. We've heard it over and over again. Even their own administration says, the Biden administration will tell you, they, this, is, this is how they act. They, they feel like they get a sense of, what, how, will you react or not? And if I were them, I'd be like, oh my gosh, you sent us a pallet of money before. You tried to unfreeze $60 billion. You haven't really retaliated that hard. You're saying don't. That's not a big threat. Um, I think they sense weakness. So I want to ask her about that and how Biden is doing and also what she thinks of Speaker Mike Johnson's tactics. Um, so let's get into it with Morgan. Now, as I said at the outset, Morgan Ortegas was the State Department spokeswoman uh, under Secretary Mike Pompeo. Uh, she was a great voice. She's extremely knowledgeable. She knows what she's talking about. She is now the founder of Polaris, uh, which is a national security organization. She does a lot of great forms, bringing people together, taking issues like this and putting them on the forefront. So without further ado, I want to get to Morgan Ortegas. But before I do that, uh, it is Halloween. The spooky season is upon us. And a lot of folks are either last weekend or this weekend coming up or even tonight. I don't know. Do you have kids? Maybe you don't. Maybe you're you're sitting at home letting everyone come knock on your door or whatever. And you want to watch a Halloween spooky type movie. Maybe you want to watch Halloween. Maybe you want to watch Nightmare on Elm Street. You open your Netflix account and you can't find it because your Netflix 
says that you live in the US. Why wouldn't it? Well, guess what? If you get ExpressVPN, and I do, I have it on my computer here. You can put it on your tablet, your phone, your computer, whatever you want. But you get ExpressVPN, and what it does is it allows you to trick the computer to tell you where you are so you don't have to be in the US anymore. Why does that matter? Well, I've learned, and I am not a tech savvy guy, admit it. But what I learned is that ExpressVPN allows you to trick your computer to tell it what country it's in. It's amazing how this works. And then you can get thousands of extra movies. You can tell it it's in Canada. You can tell it's in Australia. If you tell it's in Australia, you get to go watch Lord of the Rings too. If you tell it it's in Germany, you can go watch Top Gun. But it's as easy as that. You maximize your subscription. You're saving tens, hundred dollars. And you can actually do it not just with Netflix, but with um, Disney Plus, BBC Player, Shutter, all this stuff. It's so simple. Someone like me can figure this out using ExpressVPN. If you go to ExpressVPN slash Spicer, you can get three months free. ExpressVPN slash Spicer. It's amazing. You're literally maximizing all of these subscription accounts and going to see the catalogs in other countries. Uh, go now, expressvpn.com slash Spicer. Morgan, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Sean. So let's just start off with uh, the news of the day. Speaker Johnson putting forward a plan to fund the support to Israel, but offsetting it with funds for the IRS. The Democrats are apoplectic. People are saying it won't pass in the Senate. What are your thoughts about how the House is moving forward with this plan? Well, it probably won't pass in the Senate, but that's okay. That's, this is their first attempt at what they're what they're putting out. This is their baseline of negotiations. I mean, the president, Biden, he put out a plan that wouldn't pass the House either. So this is what both sides do. They put out what they think is uh, is their plan, what they would like to see, and then you negotiate from there. But why would you immediately start with a negotiating position that is favorable to Democrats? You should put forward what the House vision and plan is, and then the Democrats can come to the table. Exactly. I, it's funny how the default is always, well, the Senate won't take that up. Why isn't it? The, how they won't look at, to your point, the House has a, is able to take a position too, and right. they, should, they should go with that. So how do you rate how the Biden administration has been handling its response to Israel? Well, and by the way, just to follow up on what you said, it's not yeah. like the Senate puts out things that they know the House will pass, right? They right. put out what their priorities are. So this is just an attempt to malign the new speaker. Um, and he's a pretty smart and savvy guy. I don't think it's going to work. You know, listen, when you when you ask it how the, you know, how the Biden team, how I rate them dealing with Israel, it depends on who is talking, right? So if it's Admiral Kirby talking, uh, you hear, I think, a much stronger position that will probably be closer to where you and I are on supporting Israel. Israel. But then when you hear with the current White House press secretary talking, Sean, uh, that? that is uh, uh, Corinne Jean-Pierre. <laughs> oh, I, thought it, I thought it was John Kirby. <laughs> oh, good point. That's fair. Uh, when you hear her talking, she struggles to condemn anti-Semitism uh, outright. You know, she's very much she's really a part of the far left. And it, and yeah. it comes across, you know, I think she just struggles to put a sentence together, never mind on any particular policy issue. But that's a whole nother story. It's a tough job. Listen, she, they probably should have made Kirby the White House press secretary and let her to continue to learn under him to brief. You and I have had to do it. It's a really tough job. Briefing yeah. is tough. And, um, you know, some people rise to the occasion and, and others don't. So, you know, listen, Biden says really powerful and supportive things in Israel and public. Against but, but, hold on. Can I just ask you this? No. Do you think I, I think he started saying very supportive things in Israel? What at least and maybe this is the Corinne Jean-Pierre version of this. I do get the sense that they are politically trying to figure out how to handle uh, the the growing left, the movement among the left that doesn't support Israel, totally. that does side with the Palestinians. And I've seen, at least through his spokespeople, a, a sort of a, a, an attempt to justify or balance the political needs. I mean, it's a state like Michigan, which is a must win. I feel like the Biden administration came out strong on Israel, but I feel like as we move forward, they're trying to figure out how to calibrate. Uh, no, I agree with that. Uh, and what that's what I'm saying is while Biden says things, you know, a lot of time the administration is is about saying the right thing. The problem is, is for Blinken and for Jake Sullivan, who really have screwed up in theater after theater. I mean, they both have been really epic failures. Um, and I don't and I don't say that criticism lightly. I'm pretty measured. But starting from the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan that they both oversaw, uh, they screwed up Russia and Ukraine. They didn't get that right. In fact, they think they have, but we're 20 months into the war 
And they clearly haven't learned the lesson because they are applying the same logic to Israel and Hamas that they did with Russia and Ukraine. What do I mean by that? So if everything, you know, what do we do in the Trump administration? We gave military and lethal aid to the Ukrainians. Trump set very strong red lines for Putin behind the scenes, like, listen, you can't go into Ukraine and I'm going to arm them. And what, what the Biden team has done is like, well, we're not going to arm the Ukrainians until after Russia invades. Okay, Ukraine needs X, Y, Z equipment. We're going to say no for months. Then we're finally going to say yes. Then we're going to slow walk it. It's this like, well, we don't want to escalate. We don't want to upset Russia. And here you are 20 months into a war that could have been ended, as President Trump has said. He could probably end it, you know, in one day. I don't know if he did it in one day. He could certainly end it a lot quicker <laughs> than in 20 months. I can't imagine President Trump letting this go on for 20 months. So they haven't, they clearly haven't learned their lesson, Sean, and they're applying the same failed logic to Israel and Hamas. Like, well, if we escalate too much, what will Iran do? What will Hezbollah do? Well, ooh, what if? What if? Why don't we leave people worrying about, you know, let Israel do their job, right? Let people worry about what we're going to do if they cross our red lines. And it's the same, just really like tentative analysis paralysis. They are just... The bottom line is they are afraid of American strength. They don't possess anything of them all, of, within themselves that would make anyone scared of them. Stop being so worried about what Iran and what everyone else will do. That stand strong and firm for America and our allies and set red lines and be prepared to back them up, right? This isn't oh. like actually that hard. So, I mean, you're saying no, don't worry about Iran, but I, I get the feeling that Iran senses weakness. If they get no. in, I mean, just, just play this out for just a second because I, I get your point. And if we did show strength, that would solve a lot of this, but we're yeah. not. So play it out for me right now in the sense that uh, is Iran, what, what is going to cause them to escalate? What, what is, and, and how prepared should we be uh, when it comes to potentially going to war? So what Iran does um, is they, they're kind of like toddlers, right? They push and push and push and they inch up to the line and they see, you know, what are you going to do if our fast boats, you know, swarm your boats in the Gulf? What are you going to do if we use Qatab Hezbollah uh, or the Houthis or, or other, you know, Shia militia, Shia terrorist groups to hit U.S. bases? How far into the U.S. base can we hit? If we kill a contractor, what are you going to do? If you, we, if we actually see Americans injured, what are you going to do? Um, and, and so that that is they're, they're constantly testing, probing, poking. By the way, it's the same thing that the Chinese Communist Party does. So they're constantly testing and, and probing and, and poking to see how far that they can get. You know, Iran has said for a long time that it wanted to destroy the state of Israel. And this was the major flaw of the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, to me, is that we were so obsessed with the nuclear weapon, which makes sense. You don't want the nuclear, the, the Middle East to become nuclear armed. Uh, however, what we failed to recognize is that whether it was through a nuclear weapon, ballistic missiles, or terrorist groups, Iran was intent on destroying uh, Israel by any means possible. And so that's what we've seen them do is build up their ballistic missile uh, weaponry. They're closer now to getting a weapon uh, than ever, even chasing and begging them and cajoling them for three years to get back into the JCPOA also hasn't worked. The only thing that works with a theocratic revol revolutionary regime is a position of strength and punching back at them. All right, guys, most of us know what it's like to be without power, sometimes for an hour, maybe a day, a couple days after a natural disaster, a hurricane, a windstorm, you know, whatever. But now national security experts are warning that our power grid is more vulnerable than ever. And they've identified nine key substations, which if attacked, they're saying we could lose power for months, months. That's why having your own solar power is more important than ever. So I recommend the Patriot Power Generator, which is a solar generator that you don't have to install in your house. It's portable, you can take it with you. You can use it inside your house and it's powerful enough that if power goes out, we're talking your phones, your tablets, your computers, medical devices, even your refrigerator gets power. So if you go to fourpatriots.com and use code SPICER, you get 10% off your first purchase. It's fourpatriots.com, includes that Patriot power generator. You'll get a uh, that guarantee for a year, free shipping if it's over 97 bucks, and a portion of every sale is donated to charities that support veterans, right? That's great. So go to fourpatriots.com, use code SPICER, for Patriots.com, you do not want to be without power in case something happens. So if you had to calibrate, I mean, based on what we've done or not done and what they're doing, because you're right, they're getting more provocative. Uh, and I, I'd be 
I know this sounds, I, how, how concerned are you that we're headed toward um, something that is going to result in conflict with the U.S.? Well, we will only get to that position if we are weak. Right. But we, we are weak. I mean, but that's yeah. that's I mean, and that's my premise yeah. is to say, yes, we are. I mean, I get it. And that's the point. Based on that and their continued uh, provocation to your point about coming up to our boats and things like that, I, I feel like it's almost inevitable because I don't see them stopping. I mean, I, I just don't. And, and that's what I worry about is President yeah. Biden's answer is don't. It's it's not very convincing. We did finally, after you know, at least a dozen attacks in one week, uh, we did finally strike back at some targets, some Iranian targets in Syria. Um, it was, if you look at, and, and you'll know this, Sean, given your time at the White House, you know, the president is given cascading sets of options. Um, I, is, I didn't see what options the president were given, but there is no doubt in my mind that the Syria targets that were given to him were like the least, the lowest level option. Like, here's the bare minimum you could do. I mean, those... It was a response. It wasn't nothing, but it was sort of like, you know, flicking them in the nose, you know, the Iranians. Uh, I, I don't think, I don't, you know, listen, do I hope it deters them? Sure. Do I think it, do I think that they'll be back at it in the next day or two? If they weren't overnight, I'd have to check. Yeah, they probably will be. So are we in, in danger of, of this uh, escalating directly with the United States? Sure, we're in danger of it. And that's why, listen, it's not too late. But that's why I think reasonable voices uh, like my own are going to continue to call on the administration and say, you got to get tougher guys. Uh, Blinken and Austin are before the Senate Appropriations Committee this morning. And I know that they will be getting very, very tough questions from uh, from those senators as well. You know, I want to talk to you about the hostages that are being held, the U.S. hostages. Um, Put your former State Department hat back on right now. What should our posture be to get these folks back? Well, I think, listen, I do think that they're doing everything that they can. We're in a precarious position because these are, yes, they're hostages. They're also, the reality is they're human shields. Uh, right. That's why, you know, Hamas gets these people. Um, I was really encouraged with the report yesterday afternoon that the Israelis were able to go in and, and rescue one of their uh, female soldiers one of their hostages. I don't think that you'll be able to get 230 people out that way. Um, so listen, the hostage negotiators that the United States have, they're only as good like Robert O'Brien, who was national security advisor, was our hostage envoy before that. You know, he would be the first to tell you, uh, you're only as good as the president who, who backs you up, right? Because uh, uh, Robert was able to say, listen, like we need to get these people out or else I've got, you know, President Trump sitting here. Right you know, behind me. So um, the negotiations are obviously going through uh, Qatar. Um, there's been a lot of controversy there, but, you know, I, I look at it from the perspective, we negotiated with the Taliban in Qatar. Now we're negotiating with the Hamas. Uh, you know, I'd rather have the Qataris being the intermediary than other options like the Malaysians or, you know, some other options would not be great. So at least it's somebody that we, that we know quite well that are doing those negotiations. But we do obviously have the capability uh, to do what the Israelis did to go in and get people. But the problem is, is, you know, the, the Israeli guys that are going in and doing this, you know, they are not, I, I don't know what the operation looked like, but the, the people on the ground that are, that are getting the intelligence for the Israelis, these guys are going to be kind of like the Fauda movie, right? The Fauda right. show on Netflix, right? They're going to be able to blend in with the local population in a way that would be just much, much harder uh, for American uh, hostage rescue forces who also do these jobs, you know, it's, and, and, and they know the territory, right? It's right. their neighborhood. It's their backyard. The, so I do think and the American military options are going to be somewhat limited. We're going to have to rely probably mostly uh, on the Israelis and, and do what we can from a support perspective. And the negotiators, uh, I mean, listen, they're going to have to somehow convince Hamas that President Biden means business. We'll see if they have any luck at doing that. I hope so. Yeah. I'm mean, going to get these people out. Yeah, real, real quick. Last question I have for you. The, the thing that I think is unique somewhat about Israel is that so many of the U.S. folks over there are dual citizens. They're Israeli citizens, they're U.S. citizens. If the, if the U.S. had to evacuate folks because they felt like this was escalating, is the State Department in a position to do that, to handle it because of the uniqueness of that? 
Well, they should be. Is this State Department? Not really. While the situation is unique, it's not unprecedented. So I'll okay. give you an example. In 2020, uh, when COVID happened and the whole world started uh, shutting down, guess what? We had Americans all around the world that we had to, uh, over weeks and months, help get home. We ended up having to get 100 thousand Americans from around the world, not from one country, but from around the world repatriated back to the United States. Uh, that happened under Mike Pompeo and under our State Department. Uh, uh, Brian Bulatow was our undersecretary then, who had a great operations background. He elevated the people within the State Department who, um, who you know, were in charge of this, made them report directly to him, to the secretary. Uh, Blinken has changed that. Those people have now been pushed back into the bureaucracy. So this is not the first time the State Department has faced this sort of th this type of challenge. And in fact, we evacuate a lot of embassies under this administration. So you think they'd start to get better at it. <laughs> All right, Morgan, I appreciate your time today. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. Always good to be with you, Sean. You bet. All right, folks, you've heard me tell you about my friends at Delta Rescue. If you are an animal lover, then you would got to love Delta Rescue. DeltaRescue.org has an amazing video on it, some photos about the work that they're doing. These guys are a super, super sanctuary. Notice I didn't say the word shelter. They're a sanctuary. This is the kind of place that abandoned dogs, cats, horses, you name it, can go and be cared for for life. They get the veterinary care. They get the nutrition. All of the things that an animal needs, especially one that's been abandoned. And there's a million reasons that they get abandoned. Sometimes the owner can't help them, whatever. But Delta Rescue doesn't care. If you go to deltarescue.org, like I said, they'll show you how they're happening. The thing about Delta Rescue, though, is they rely totally on donations from people like me and you, animal lovers that want to make sure that these animals are taken care of. And if you go to deltarescue.org, you can make a donation. Any amount is, is great. Five bucks, 20 bucks, 50, 100, whatever you can support. Uh, I've talked to the owner and the founder of Delta Rescue, Leo Grill. He is committed to making this an enduring mission so that it outlasts all of us and make sure that these dogs and cats and animals never have to worry about anything. Please go to deltarescue.org, take a look at the videos, see their newsletter, and help them continue the amazing work they're doing, deltarescue.org. I love that conversation with Morgan. She is so insightful and breaks it down in a way that we can all understand what's happening and cuts through the clutter. Um, I thought it was interesting because, again, a lot of people can give you their punditry answer. She was at the State Department. She watched them deal with hostage crisis situations. I thought the COVID example was fantastic. I did not think about it in that context. That's why, you know, you bring someone like Morgan on board to have that conversation. Because you talked about, I mean, I was thinking about this the other day. David Friedman, right, our former ambassador, he was on the show breaking on what's going on, breaking down what's going on in Israel. Well, David Friedman lives there. He's a dual citizen. I've had Joel Rosenberg, great author, friend of my former show. Um, I've communicated with him about what's happening. Lives in Israel, dual citizen. Well, they've all chosen to stay, but what happens if it really gets hot over there? What if Iran really turns up? How are they getting out? What's the State Department prepared to do? You know, there's, there's no more U.S. flights in there. So this is largely going to have to be a maritime evacuation go over the coast, you load people up on ships and you get them out. How is the State Department preparing for that? And I think Morgan's point was under the Trump administration, this was something that they really had to think about, not just in one country, but around the world, getting people back through, you know, when COVID happens. Um, I was grateful for her ex explanation about hostage negotiations. I mean, this is, this is not like they're being taken care of by a nation state. You think about the negotiations that President Trump went through, even with North Korea. Um, and that what they've, they're doing to get people back in Russia. And it's, it's a nation state to a nation state. Hamas is a terrorist organization. You don't just pick up the phone and call them. Um, and I think it was interesting to hear Morgan's perspective on that. Um, and I also was really interested, um, in this whole issue with Iran. And I know that she still was being diplomatic. You could hear it, right? I mean, she was like, well, I think, but it's scary stuff. And I know no one wants to think about it, but it's a reality. It's it's just I I, I and again it's 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 one of those things that we don't want to talk about because I think sometimes it's difficult and it's it is scary. But the reality is is that th there is a decent chance that something's going to escalate and go wrong. It doesn't look good. I hope I'm wrong. I hope it doesn't come to that. 
But you don't see Iran cowering. Yemen this morning was firing off missiles that we shut down. These guys aren't calming down. They're not scared of us right now. I've said this since the get-go, that when, when Biden screwed up Afghanistan, there was a sense of weakness on several fronts, how we treated our allies, how we got out, how we left all that material there. And then Putin looks at it and invades Ukraine, and now Hamas firing rockets. There is a sense of weakness of a lack of American strength. And I think that's a big deal. Um, so you, you've got, uh, actually, let me just pause for a second. I want to get into what Mike Johnson is doing. And, um, and then I'll get back to how this plays into both Trump and the 2024 election, as well as this White House. So Speaker Johnson, everyone's kind of wondering, how's the guy going to come out of the gate? And he showed it. So he comes out and he says, all right, I'm going to first, and this is why at the beginning of the show, I said there's two catches, two catches. The first was he said, I'm separating any aid to Israel from that of Ukraine. So he pulled it out. That's the first catch. And that infuriates everyone, all the, the people in the Senate and the Biden administration. Because that's how, they get it. Ukraine aid is not popular. And they can't defend it the same way. Because I don't think there, there is a defense right now because they're not willing to explain what the long-term strategy is or where the money's going. They, he gave that speech the other day. Remember Biden gave that primetime speech and it was muddled. He's basically trying to slide the Ukraine funding in under the guise of Israel. He can't explain it. He can't give you a long-term plan. He can't tell you where the money's going. They admitted on the ground that there's a ton of corruption and they know it. There's a report that came out. They get it. They know this is not popular and that they can't defend it, but they also can't say no because it would look bad. So instead of doing the right thing, which is having an accounting of the money, trying to figure out how to get around the corruption, they know with a straight face, they cannot tell you that the money and the weaponry that's going over there is being used in a good way. They just can't. Their own administration did a report talking about the corruption and they came out with this sanitized version of it. But the bottom line is, it's not good. So Johnson did the smart thing. But then he went a step further and he basically says, okay, I'm going to offset the $14.3 billion to Israel with funding to the IRS. Uh-oh. Now I want to read you from a section of political playbook this morning because this is it. It says, then on Monday, Johnson unveiled his $14.3 billion Israel aid package one that not only seeks to offset the spending with cuts elsewhere, but taps Democrats' signature domestic policy legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, to do it. As a policy matter, reversing the bill's IRS plus-up doesn't make a lot of sense. Cutting the agency's planned enforcement surge against tax evaders would have the perverse effect of increasing budget deficits, not trimming them. So again, this is just to set the stage, the first rebuttal from here, the media doing the bidding of the Democrats, which is to say, oh, this money to the IRS, you know what that was going to do? It was going to go after tax cheats. It was going to go after people who weren't paying their taxes. So these folks, yes, we we're spending money on agents, let's say a million dollars on agents, but those million dollars in agents were going to find, you know, $20 million of taxes that weren't coming in from people who weren't paying their appropriate taxes or were cheating or evading taxes, right? So they're calling it actually, it's hurting. You know what? You should keep funding the IRS. That's because, so, and it, remember what I'm saying. This is, I'm reading from Politico's playbook. This is the media doing the bidding of the Democratic Party, saying, oh, don't cut the IRS. These are the good guys. And you Republicans who care about taxes and blah, 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 blah. Look at, you, you know, you couldn't possibly do this. But here's the thing that at least I'll give them credit for. Let me read you the next line. But as a political matter, the logic, this is them opining on what Speaker Johnson is doing. The logic is impeccable. The libs, after all, were owned. He gets it. They go on to say Democrat after Democrat, including some of Israel's most stalwart allies, sputtered in fury over the os offset plan, as our Hill colleague thoroughly documented. Rep. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, D. Florida, she's from the Boca area 
accused Johnson of, quote, playing political games with Israel emergency funding, something our nation has never done in a time of crisis. Yeah, right. She, you know, what suddenly would offset this? We've never offset spending. Not true. She just doesn't like the fact that, again, what Johnson is doing is putting Democrats in a very untenable situation. You want to spend money? Offset it. Offset it with the IRS. So now Democrats are in this untenable position. What do we do? Do we have, we have to vote? So hopefully our friends in the media will come to our salvation and save us so that we don't have to explain that we would rather support the IRS. Said Rep. Josh Gottheimer, New Jersey, in a statement to Jewish Insider, if the extreme right wing plays politics with assistance to Israel and Ukraine during a time of crises, it will only empower America's enemies. Unbelievable. Over in the Senate, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer promptly announced the plan DOA, while Finance Committee Chair Ron Wyden, D. Oregon, called it an absolute non-starter and accused Republicans of or prioritizing giveaways to wealthy tax cheats. You see this? It's DOA, therefore, it's dead on the, why would the House sent over? I thought that it was great how Morgan brought this up at the beginning of our conversation. Why is it that the Senate just gets to decide what's good? If we don't send back something that's palatable, the Senate, how dare you? Why doesn't the Senate have to eat what the House is sending? It's a one-way street, isn't it? As far as the media and the left is concerned. They get to send over and the House should find a way to accept it. But when the House sends over something, it's DOA. What about, why is it never DOA in the House when the Senate sends it? Because it is. Because the media is part of the democratic machine, and they want to tell you this. But here's the thing that's interesting. Um, This is them. Again, let me go back to Politico. Yet there's evidence that Johnson's move to split Democrats might actually work, at least a little bit. Moskowitz, this is, uh, they're referring back to uh, a Democratic member from Florida, Jared Moskowitz. Moskowitz, despite his complaints, said he was, quote, not going to take the bait and would vote for the bill. Would vote for the bill. So this is an interesting thing. This gets back to to Johnson. It says, but Johnson chose to throw a political grenade at Democrats and keep his own debt and deficit obsessed conference as united as possible and understand the choice given the upheaval in the House GOP has seen this month. Here's the thing. I give Johnson a ton of credit. Right out of the gate, this guy's saying, you know what? I'm not going to just roll over and let the Senate throw something. I'm going to offset it, send it back to them, make them have to tell me that the IRS is worth defending. Isn't that? See, this is the checkers that we have been missing. We've been playing chess, excuse me, checkers. And finally, someone's playing chess. Make these Democrats be in an uncomfortable situation. We, we've been willing, unwilling to fight. Everyone goes, oh, well, the Senate's not going to move. The Senate's not going to do this. Abide. Why do we care? Start fighting. Fight back. Do something like this. Kudos to Mike Johnson. Yes, it's not. I agree. Prob- the Senate's not going to deal with that, but it forces them. Okay, I see. You. I mean, this is one-upsmanship. Make them. Make Chuck Schumer prioritize the IRS. Why not? Why not make him do it? I don't, I don't think this. It breaks out the Ukraine funding. Make them talk about it. Make them defend this stuff. Where is the accountability on Ukraine? What are we doing with the money? Where's the money that we sent them? Why hasn't anyone wanted to talk about the administration's own report on corruption over there? Because it goes against the narrative. They don't want us to do it. Just say yes. Send us the blank check. You know, I, I think that this is, um, this is what America finally wants is a Republican party and conservatives willing to stand up and fight, fight for our, our tax dollars and for our interests. Too often these things get sent to us as some sort of binary position. Do you support Ukraine or not? Well, that's not fair. It's like saying, do you want to go to lunch or not? And then saying, okay, well, here are the choices. The most, you know, going to Capitol Grill or not eating. Well, no, that's not, that's not the range. Have a peanut butter or jelly sandwich. You don't have to spend $200 on lunch or get nothing. And that's what the media would like to pretend. Do you support this or not? No, I think what Mike Johnson is doing is saying, hey, I'm proud to support Israel. I want to support Israel. 
why can't we offset it with excessive government spending here? Why not? But this is the, no one on the, uh, for a while has been willing to fight these fights to think like this. I want to be able to support things, but I don't want to have to just keep writing blank checks that, by the way, China is backfilling by buying our debt. What, I mean, where's the thought? Where's the process of actually being smart about how we do business and how we, how we exist? It's just not there. All right. I want to segue this conversation though into the 2024 election. Trump was campaigning in Iowa and he brought this up and I think it was just so brilliant. And it's a conversation I have with people all the time. They complain about Trump. They all, you know, domestically and internationally. Oh, I don't like this. But stop for a moment. I have this conversation almost probably every 48 hours because it's not every day. How can you support President Trump? And I'll go, okay, how can I support President Trump? Let's talk about where we are today. And then I talk about the domestic policy stuff, right? Interest rates, the southern border, fentanyl crisis. I mean, I could just go on. The rest of the economy. Okay, all of these things are happening, and I'm, I'm missing a bunch. And then I start looking at foreign policy. The Afghanistan withdrawal, an absolute disaster. I talked about this a moment ago. Not just to our own military, but to our neighbors that we never told we were leaving. How we left Afghanistan, we just gave up a base that's a check on China. I mean, think about how close that is to China. We just gave it up. We spent billions and billions and billions of dollars over two decades, and we walked out of there gave me up a massive strategic position vis-a-vis -vis China. Then you look at the weapons that we left that are now in the hands of terrorists. I mean, that's how we started this administration. What a disaster. And what does Putin do? He says, hey, that's pretty weak. So I'm going to go and invade Ukraine. And we do nothing. We say a lot of things. And then Hamas, and well, actually, let's stop for a second. You see North Korea getting provocative. China getting further provocative, provocative in the South China Sea. Do you see the video this week of that B-52? The Chinese plane comes within 10 feet. 10 feet. That's what they're thinking. I mean, they think they can get away with this stuff. Actually, they did. China won't even talk right now. There's a potential meeting with Biden in a few weeks. Are you kidding me? Our president can't get them on the phone. And then Hamas starts firing rockets. What the, so Trump's in Iowa, and he says that it happened for three reasons. That Israel, um, that Hamas is doing this because he said Iran is reaping the oil revenue from the last sanctions enforcement. Our country's perceived weakness during Biden's term, and now the U.S. freeing up this additional $6 billion. Trump pointed to his own sanction enforcement and the unilateral withdrawal from the multi-nation Iran nuclear agreement as evidence that he would be tougher on Iran if, if elected instead of Biden in 2024. I was there. I was part of that White House team when President Trump said, I'm getting out of the Iran nuclear agreement. This is insane. And he did it. He didn't try to appease them. He basically said, we're out. You guys are violating this agreement. Why are we turning a blind eye to it? But think about this. For the first time in several administrations, Russia didn't invade anybody or annex land. They waited like, what, an hour before Biden, after Afghanistan, We're like, all right, we'll just go in and start taking parts of Ukraine. Iran didn't do anything. In fact, like I said, he showed strength. He pulled out of the agreement. Moss wasn't firing rockets. And he makes this case that all of this during his tenure, um, there was peace. There was safety. He protected Israel. He protected the country. I mean, I think that these guys feared Trump. They didn't know what he was going to do. They were scared that he was going to attack them or act unprovoked. Think about this. The whole Millie thing during the, the transition where Millie's calling China and saying, hey, guys, don't worry. Because these guys were, they were worried about how Trump was going to, what he was going to do. He kept them off balance. I was at Mar-a-Lago Mar having dinner with the Chinese communist chair, President Xi, when Trump went off to that room, the secret, the, the secure room, to watch what we had done in Syria. And he comes back and he tells Xi, as desserts being served, like, hey, guess what we just did? And I think she's going, what the heck? 
because that was how Trump was. He was like, hey, I'm going to show you we're not kidding around. He gets up, just leaves in the middle of dinner to go watch this thing happen, comes sit back down and says, oh, by the way, you want the chocolate cake? Here you go. I'm going to tell you what I just did. These guys were worried about him. They don't have that same fear. They don't perceive American strength the way that they did. And I, I think this is a big, big issue right now because Trump portrayed Biden as administration as being weak and out of touch, noting that national security, Jake Sullivan, said that less than two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago, just remember this, Jake Sullivan, this public thing, that the Middle East is, quote, quieter today than it ever has been in two days, two decades. That was Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor of the president. It has been quieter today than it has been in two decades. Great job, Jake. Good job there, huh? Anyway, I think that Trump's making a big deal out of this. And, and you ask about, you, you could juxtapose this with what's happening in the current White House. Kamala Harris, former aide, is asking for signatures on a ceasefire in this conflict. Cori Bush drafted up the ceasefire. A ceasefire. What are you talking about? Israel got attacked. They have a right to go in and defend itself, to get back their hostages, and to retaliate. And you, these guys are talking about ceasefires? What? I, I mean, this is what the letter says. We must mourn the tragic loss of Israeli life targeted by Hamas. However, we must firmly and unequivocally reject the Israeli government's exploitation of these deaths. Exploitation? 1,400 people were killed? This isn't exploitation. This is retaliation. They need to stand up of these deaths to stage a retaliatory and genocidal campaign against civilians. Oh, my goodness. That's what the left is dealing with. Balancing. What about right and wrong? Israel was attacked. They have a right to go in and do this. And that's how the left is handling. That's this administration. But it's it's becoming a bigger deal. I mean, I talked about the poll yesterday, right? Of where things stand in the Republican field. Part of this is Trump's going out, like I said, making that message. Now you have Ramaswamy going after Nikki Haley over Israel. And the thing is, is that Nikki Haley was there for Trump. So, I mean, it's, I, I don't, I just don't see it happening, but it's becoming a bigger issue. And I think Trump gained strength in this. Um, he is gaining more and more. And we saw in the, in the Iowa poll him go up while others were going down, just Pence dropping out, DeSantis dropping several, because it's not hard. When you're running for president, most of the time you're talking about the future. I will do this. I promise you that. I'm going to make this happen. Blah, 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 blah. Well, here's what Trump can say. I did this. This is what I did. Look at my record. And when it comes to um, his four years, you may not like him. You may not like the text, the tweets rather. He doesn't tax there. But the bottom line is we were safe. Right? We were safe. There was none of this. And that's the one thing he can say nobody else can do. Anyway, uh, thank you for subscribing. I hope you have a happy Halloween. Uh, watch the show first. Then you can go out and trick or treat. Uh, if you want, please make sure you comment in the sections. T tell me about my Fetterman outfit. Uh, you can also text 571-441-4991. Uh, I appreciate Morgan Ortegas uh, doing this. Andrew Clavin's going to join us tomorrow. He's got a really good take on what's going on in Hollywood. Uh, the Daily Wire is putting Disney on edge, on their heels with this new Snow Eight movie. I'm going to tell you all about that. Um, and then on Friday, we're meeting with Dinesh D'Souza. I've got a little surprise coming your way on that one. But again, Andrew Clavin tomorrow, Dinesh D'Souza on Friday. Um, Thank you for everything you're doing. Please do me a favor. I always ask you this. Hit that subscribe button, but then also hit the bell so that you get notifications uh, and drop a five star on Spotify or Apple if you're listening to the audio versions. Thanks again. I look forward to seeing you right back here tomorrow on The Sean Spicer Show. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.